Hello Health 230 students. Today I will be lecturing on chapter number 26 on diabetes and in the first couple pages there you will see an overview of diabetes. It talks a little bit about the function of the pancreas and insulin. I found a video on YouTube that does a wonderful job of animating the process and showing what, pan what the pancreas does and what insulin does. I recommend going out there and taking a look at that. I also recommend going out to CNN and watching a special put together by Dr. Sanjay Gupta that does a very good job of, of providing perspective on how big the issue of diabetes is in, in America. And uh, I, don't, I don't think that you can fully appreciate the information in chapter number 26 until you understand what a big problem diabetes is here in the U.S. So please uh, watch that special. All right. Um, diabetes affects about 10% of the adult population. It ranks sixth among the leading causes of death in the U.S. And people who have diabetes are, are oftentimes going to have fairly significant vascular disease. And when a person, of course, has vascular disease, one of the main um, main tissues that is affected by vascular disease is the heart, which uh, vascular disease in the heart can lead to heart attack. Vascular disease in general can also lead to stroke. Uh, peripheral artery disease as well. And uh, once a person has diabetes for a long enough period of time, uh, they are going to suffer from kidney disease and ultimately kidney failure. Diabetes is characterized by a group of disorders. Uh, first and foremost, elevated blood glucose, um, disordered insulin metabolism. We'll talk at length about what that word disordered means because it's not always necessarily the same, uh, same issue depending upon where a person is in their diabetes progression. And lastly, um, they're unable to to secrete sufficient insulin, and this is going to happen once a person has full-blown diabetes. <clears throat> now let's let's talk a minute about normal pancreatic and insulin production, and hopefully you watched that video on YouTube, and you're you're wrapping your mind around what the pancreas does and and why it does what it does. When we eat, in particular when we eat carbohydrates, the pancreas is going to release insulin. That insulin is going to very quickly make its way into the blood, it's circulating around through the body, and that means that tissue out in the body will be exposed to insulin. And what what that says, what insulin says to those tissues is, hey, you need to allow for glucose to be absorbed at this time. The, the problem is, though, that in diabetics, that oftentimes these tissues need no more energy. They need no more glucose. So they, so they don't. <laughs> and we call that insulin resistance. And when a tissue is insulin resistant, that means that the glucose that otherwise would be making its way into the tissue is staying in the blood. And thus we end up with high levels of glucose. Um, uh, insulin is released in, in smaller amounts in between meals, but that's simply just to minimize the effects of glucagon. I don't think we need to necessarily get into glucagon all that much. <clears throat> um, I'm going I'm to talk just generally here for a moment um, about the progression of diabetes and not go bullet, po bullet point by bullet point here. Um, in, in the early stages of diabetes development, and, and by the way, uh, keep in mind that I am primarily talking about di diabetes type 2 as we go through this chapter. Um, in the early stages of development of di type 2 or adult onset diabetes, um, what we're going to see is that a person has been eating relatively high levels of, of simple sugars, um, things like uh, in, drinking a lot of soda, uh, eating a lot of candy bars, ice creams, just foods in general that have a lot of sucrose or what we also call table sugar in them, you know, sweet foods. And uh, when a person does that over a period of time, the the, uh, the the pancreas is going to produce insulin at very high levels to try to counteract 
the negative effects of high blood glucose or high levels of energy in the blood. And early on, the pancreas does a fairly good job of that. However, over time, um, the, the cells become progressively more resistant to absorbing that extra energy because they just, they just don't need it. They just don't need any additional energy. So they, they say, thanks, but no thanks. We don't need any additional energy. And at that point, the glucose stays out in the blood. And we see uh, progressively elevated levels of glucose. And at that time, the pancreas is still usually working fairly well. So the person gets very high levels of insulin. We see um, usually we're, we're seeing quite a bit of body weight uh, gain uh, up to that point. And thereafter, then the the even though the the insulin is being produced, um, and I guess I've already said that that even though the insulin is being produced, it's not being absorbed, or the glucose is not being absorbed. And then what we see is a situation where the pancreas just gets overworked. The pancreas is producing insulin and produ producing insulin and producing insulin day after day after day, and eventually insulin production starts to be reduced. And um, when insulin production is starts to be reduced. Well, th then we we compound the problem because not only do we have this insulin resistance that's going on, but when you really do need um, for glucose to be taken up into the cells, the pancreas can't do its job and can't signal, can't send that that messenger um, in the form of insulin out into the blood and say, "Hey guys, we got we've got massive amounts of sugar in here in the blood. Uh, we've absolutely." we absolutely have to do something so cells do your thing so you, you kinda get this double whammy effect of the cells not taking up glucose and secondarily you have the pancreas not producing an adequate amount of insulin um, that condition of high levels of glucose in the blood that's called hyperglycemia and over time, when a person has hyperglycemia, there will be damage to the blood vessels, nerves, and tissue. Uh, this is figure 26-1, and you're going to see how rapidly diabetes has been increasing. Just take, take, take a look at that on your own. You'll see, you'll, your jaw will drop. Some symptoms of diabetes. Uh, glucosuria, that just means glucose in the, the urine in a normal functioning kidney. It's not going to allow uh, glucose into the urine, but when levels are very high, that does happen. Uh, frequent urination, dehydration, increased thirst. In some cases, um, there's going to be weight loss, actually. I'd, Th th throw that one out. We'll talk. For forget about that one, <laughs> um, because we're going to talk about when weight gain occurs and when weight loss occurs. Uh, more often than not, we're seeing a person gaining very significant amounts of weight um, in the early stages of diabetes. Uh, increased hunger or polyphagia, uh, blurred vision, increased infections, fatigue. Diagnosis of diabetes is primarily based upon testing of glucose levels, and um, uh, that's that's done under fasting conditions. Um, there's also an oral glucose tolerance test, and that's where a patient ingests a a very sugary drink, um, a glucose load of somewhere around 50 to 75 grams, and that's that's a lot of glucose. That is a a whole lot of glucose. <laughs> um, that's going to be more um, more simple sugar than than you're going to find in a soda. And then plasma glucose or blood glucose is tested um, at intervals following that ingestion or following ingestion of that food or drink. And um, ideally what we want to see is that the, the cells and pancreas do their job, that the pancreas releases insulin, that there's uptake of the glucose into the cells, and that very quickly blood glucose levels come back down to a normal level. In a diabetic, that doesn't happen. In a diabetic, the blood glucose levels are going to stay elevated for an extended period of time. Criteria used for diagnosis of diabetes, 
uh, random plasma tests um, indicating that blood glucose levels are greater than or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter, fasting plasma glucose levels that are still greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter, and that's saying that after eight hours of eating nothing, that a person's glucose is still greater than 126, and that's that is a, a very good indication that um, a person has some some issues. And uh, lastly, uh, plasma glucose uh, greater than or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter two hours after consuming that 75 gram glucose load that I mentioned just a moment ago, or, or after taking a tolerance test. There's also another condition called prediabetes. Prediabetes can be identified if a person has a fasting glucose level between 100 and 125. Um, or if blood glucose levels are between 140 to 200 milligrams per deciliter after the tolerance test. Uh, in table 26-3, you're going to see some, some features of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, just read down through there. Ty type 1, <clears throat> um, yeah, that's, that's usually childhood onset. And, um, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about two very different conditions. Ty type one, uh, that's uh, that's that is a genetic um, condition where the pancreas just does not release insulin. Uh, type two, very different situation where over time a person basically is, is, has beaten up their pancreas and the pancreas doesn't work appropriately. Just very briefly, I'm going to touch on type 1 diabetes, and um, it's an autoimmune destruction of the beta cells within the pancreas, and th that occurs fairly early in life, and uh, it's not unusual at all for the symptoms to appear very abruptly, and um, the symptoms include frequent urination, weight loss, and, and that's one of the biggies, uh, big, big differences between type 1 and type 2 is that uh, weight loss is common in type 1. That's not, not, it's not common at all in type 2. And um, moving on to type 2, we, we've already talked about that. Um, I'm going to skip over that. It is worth saying that Type 2 diabetes is more common in certain populations. You see them listed there. And we're going to talk at length about this later on. Let's talk about acute complications. Uh, if a person has a severe lack of insulin in type 1, um, th there, there will be consequences. And um, <clears throat> that doesn't happen a lot. Um, most of the time, people who are type 1 diabetics, they've been monitoring their glucose level and administering insulin for so long that, uh, that they have a pretty good idea of when, when they need to eat and when they need insulin. However, sometimes in, in atypical situations, things do happen. And um, years ago, I, I, I knew a type 1 diabetic that was a competitive swimmer and uh, from time to time she would forget to and uh, maybe I, don't know, I shouldn't say forget that she, she she just she would not give herself an adequate amount of insulin prior to um, or after eating and prior to workouts and um, she would sometimes uh, she, she would sometimes get um, get a bit delusional when she was swimming laps and um, yeah, that, that that is a very dangerous situation All right, moving on actually I'll take it back I do need to go back just a little bit when there is that severe lack of insulin being released that, that can lead to a situation where triglycerides are being being broken down and utilized as the primary energy source and when that happens, there's going to be uh, there's going to be a very significant amount of fatty acids released into the bloodstream, and that can lead to a situation called ketoacidosis. And ketoacidosis is just a big fancy word for saying the ketone bodies have been have been released. I need to stop here um, so that I don't exceed my time limit. We'll pick back up with lecture two of two.